My name is Dr. Robert Sangregali. I'm a cardiologist and electrophysiologist at the Doylestown Health Woodall Center for Heart and Vascular Care. Today, I've been asked to talk to you about atrial fibrillation, or AFib. We'll discuss its causes, its symptoms, and treatment options that are available. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular and often, but not always, rapid irregular heart rhythm that can lead to stroke, heart failure, and other cardiovascular complications. During normal heart rhythm, the upper chamber of the heart initiates the rhythm. The bottom chamber of the heart then follows. This sequence or coordination is lost during atrial fibrillation. During atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers of the heart beat rather chaotically. The bottom chambers of the heart only intermittently follow. With this, the heart has lost coordination. This results in marked inefficiency of the heart as a mechanical pump. This often leads to symptoms such as shortness of breath, exertional fatigue, and palpitations. With this less efficient heart pump, blood tends to move more slowly in the heart. When this occurs, blood clots can form in the heart, and if blood clots form in the heart, they could enter the circulation, travel within the circulation, travel north to the brain, get lodged in a blood vessel, and lead to a stroke. Stroke is the most feared complication from atrial fibrillation. People often ask me, but why did I develop atrial fibrillation? Well, most commonly, there is some pre-existing underlying structural abnormality of the heart, often previously undiagnosed. Such abnormalities could include things like high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, heart attack, heart failure, abnormalities of the heart valves. It could also include other conditions such as lung disease, sleep apnea, obesity, and some metabolic conditions such as abnormality of thyroid function. When atrial fibrillation is diagnosed, it's very important to evaluate the potential underlying conditions because when they are present, treating these conditions often markedly improves the management of patients with atrial fibrillation. There are some patients, however, that develop atrial fibrillation without any known structural heart abnormalities. We used to call these patients lone atrial fibrillation. This speaks to the fact that there is really no other reason to develop atrial fibrillation. We know now that in these patients, there's a, likely a very strong genetic component. The dangers of atrial fibrillation include its most feared complication, and that is stroke. Patients with atrial fibrillation are on average five times greater risk of developing stroke but anyone's individual risk really varies, and patients with atrial fibrillation should have a discussion with their physician to determine their own specific risk. Other factors which increase the risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation is coexisting conditions, such as hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, having had a prior stroke, having vascular disease, also, advancing AIDS is associated with an increased risk of stroke, particularly starting at about the age of 65. Other complications of atrial fibrillation include heart failure. This is a condition where the pumping function of the heart becomes so inefficient that it cannot meet the body's demand for blood flow. This often leads to symptoms such as fatigue and shortness of breath. Of course, another complication of atrial fibrillation, which may not generally be considered a medical complication, but certainly in a patient's life is a significant complication, is the reduced quality of life that patients with atrial fibrillation often experience. And again, this is mostly due to things like exertional fatigue and shortness of breath. Treatments for atrial fibrillation should be individualized and based on how long you've had atrial fibrillation, how bothersome the atrial fibrillation is to you, and if atrial fibrillation has caused any heart damage or any other cardiovascular complications. However, universally, the main concern we have in treating patients with atrial fibrillation is avoiding stroke, and the mainstay of therapy for that is blood thinning medications. I mentioned earlier that with atrial fibrillation, blood flow in the heart can be quite slow. Blood clots can form, enter the circulatory system, and travel north to the brain and cause a stroke. 
with blood thinning medications or anticoagulation, we can dramatically reduce the risk of blood clot formation. Some people with atrial fibrillation are at very high risk of developing blood clot and stroke, but unfortunately cannot tolerate blood thinning medications, typically due to some bleeding complication. In these patients, we still have another option. This is called left atrial appendage occlusion. With this procedure, we thread a catheter up from the veins of the leg, guide it through the blood vessels up into the heart. Then we can deploy a small device to close off a small sac called an appendage in the left upper chamber of the heart. This is the area where the vast majority of blood clots form. By placing this small device there and walling off this area, we can markedly reduce the risk of stroke, even in patients who cannot tolerate blood thinning medications. While options for disease management and symptom control in patients with atrial fibrillation include things like rate control and rhythm control, there has recently been a push from our major cardiovascular societies to consider rhythm control much earlier in the disease process. In fact, very recently, there was an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine just October 2020, which compared patients with atrial fibrillation receiving an early strategy of rate control versus an early strategy of rhythm control. And those with rhythm control strategy gained marked benefit. In fact, there was a marked reduction in cardiovascular events, such as death from cardiovascular causes, stroke, being hospitalized for heart failure, or being hospitalized for heart attacks. Medications can sometimes be used to obtain and maintain a normal rhythm in somebody with atrial fibrillation. Unfortunately, these medications are not always very successful and can be quite difficult to take for some patients. Importantly, there is another option, and that is catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. This is a procedure where we thread a catheter up from the veins of the leg up into the heart, and we search for those areas that initiate or cause atrial fibrillation. When we find those areas, we can deliver targeted energy either in the form of heat, called radiofrequency, or by freezing, called cryoablation. We use these techniques to destroy or eliminate the cells that initiate or trigger atrial fibrillation. This procedure can be very successful. 